Hey, how's it going? So Drizzle ORM has been generating quite a lot of buzz lately and I've been wanting to look into it to see how does it compare to things like Prisma, Type ORM, Micro ORM, all those other options. I haven't actually personally used it for a project yet, so I figured why don't I take you along to how I'm exploring this and to kind of just give you my uh, personal first impressions as I'm going through the documentation and the usage of it. Now, in order for us to actually demo how Drizzle works, we need a database to connect to. And for this video, I'll be using Neon, which is a serverless Postgres database. Uh, you can create an account, it's free. Now for Neon, when you first create a database, it'll give you uh, the connection uh, configuration, like your username and password and stuff like that. I'm personally providing those things to my Postgres client using uh, environment variables. So I'll probably blur this out so that you can see the credentials but you can see this is what I have. Now I have a very simple project here and I'll, I'll walk you through the setup. Uh, so what I have as dependencies is .env obviously to read our uh, environment variables from that env file. You have to install Drizzle ORM itself because you know that's what we're gonna use. I'm also using the Postgres uh, package here which is, uh, I think it's similar to the PG one which is probably what most people know about but it's, it's supposed to be newer um, faster and stuff like that. You can look into it. For dev dependencies, I have types for node, Drizzle kit, which is what we're going to use for things like introspection and migrations. I'll walk you through that in a little bit. And then TSX is just a way for us to run TypeScript files. So you can see that I have uh, an index.tsx here, which is going to be our sort of file where we're going to run our queries. And you can see what we have here for the scripts is that we have our like I said, we have an index.ts that is being run by TSX. It's also being watched for changes so that it'll automatically reload. And then we're also running .env so that the variables are loaded in. So basically our credentials to the database. And then we also have two other commands here. One is for introspection. You can see it's drizzle kit introspect and then the specific uh, type of database that we're using. And then a path to our configuration which I'll walk you through in a little bit. And then same thing for generate. Uh, the only difference is we have generate here instead of introspect. So th that's designed for uh, migrations, right? So that's pretty much all we need for this video. Uh, feel free to pause the screen and copy and install what you need. So let's go back into index.ts and let's take a look at how you connect to a database. So like I said, we're using the Postgres uh, library here. And, and for the credentials, it's reading those environment variables that I showed earlier. So as you can see, the setup is pretty simple. You have your configured client connection, you pass that client to Drizzle, and then it gives you a reference to what is the database. So if you're kind of comparing to something like Prisma, think of DB as like your, your Prisma client, except that you don't have to build or generate anything. It's really just whatever this returns, you can run you know, SQL queries off of that. So you can do like db.select and stuff like that. We'll walk through some examples. Now real quick in the documentation, it does say, uh, you know, if you look at all the databases that they support, I specifically use the Postgres.js one just because I think uh, not everyone is gonna be using Neon. So the Postgres one is, is a little bit more familiar to other people or Node Postgres, other databases. So let me show you my SQL real quick, uh, my SQL two. Same thing, instead you install MySQL 2, you create a connection to it, pass it into Drizzle, same thing. And you can see that they have support here for uh, things like Planet Scale, which is on MySQL, and then a couple of things here for SQLite. All right, so moving forward, I figured a good way to start testing uh, Drizzle was to, so we have our connection. I figured I'll create a table here because most people that are probably gonna switch to Drizzle or try to drizzle will probably uh, use it for an existing database, right? They're not necessarily going to start with something empty. So I'll go into uh, SQL editor here. I actually have an old query here that I'm just going to run, which creates a table for to do's. We have our configuration set up for introspection. We have the introspect, and then you can pass it a custom config file. We can take a look at that drizzle.config.ts. And you can see that similarly, it's just defining the uh, credentials for the, the database connection. Let's go ahead and run that and see what it outputs for us. We'll do npm run introspect. There you go. It says that I created some 
uh, SQL files for me and a new schema.ts. So in our drizzle folder here, you can see that there is a uh, new SQL file. It has a create table not exists for the to do, but it's commented out because it's assuming that if it's, if it's introspecting, right, it's already there, it doesn't have to create it. And then it has uh, the schema file. And this is uh, a quick look at, you know, how do you define your tables via JavaScript, which you can see they sort of prefer a, like a chaining syntax, uh, but it's still very close to what, you know, the, the SQL will look like, right? For example, here they have ID serial primary key, not null, very similar, right? ID serial primary key, not null. Title varchar 50, not null. Title varchar, title length 50, not null, right? So it's it's trying to, from my understanding, be as close to SQL as possible. Again, I guess as a comparison to Prisma, they usually have their own syntax, which you have to learn, although it's not difficult. Compared to something like TypeORM, usually they would define a class with decorators. Here, it's just a uh, an option of chained function calls. And you also notice that this is specifically a PG table, which I think is a pretty interesting take because instead of working at a higher abstraction to support uh, both MySQL and uh, Postgres, they decide to just have two separate uh, ways to get into it, right? So here's the docs for uh, Postgres, similar to what you saw, there's PG table. If you look at MySQL, you can see that they have MySQL table. And same thing for SQLite, they have a SQLite table. So I think it's trying to call out the fact that there's slight differences in APIs for the two of these. So again, I think that's worth calling out that it's trying its best to not over abstract and instead just have uh, a light layer above your your driver, I think. Anyways, I think this schema file is uh, something you pretty much wouldn't touch again because, because I think you'd probably only do introspection once, right? After you've done introspection, you'd probably switch over to migrations, assuming that you are using Drizzle going forward. So we're gonna paste that code into our schema.ts here, and then I think we can just delete this one. And why it's down here, remember in our Drizzle config, we have uh, a pointer to that path. So that's where it's gonna look at uh, things for migrations. So for example, why don't we go ahead and try build some stuff out, like perhaps let's say that a, maybe we're building like a, a task manager. So we have users with to-dos. So let's try something. So let's create a PG table of users. Or actually let's do uh let's do singular here. And actually let's let's see what happens when we change this as well. Uh, I just wanna see how the migration sort of handles every name like that. Um but anyways, let's do a user. Uh they probably also have an ID. Let's copy this over and then Let's give him a varying name of, make this 30. And I also wanna describe the relationship between these two. So I wanna say that a user has one too many to-dos. Let's go take a look at the documentation. All right, so I was reading through the documentation a little bit here. It looks like to define relations, first of all, we have to add something new to our to-do table here what that says who is the owner of this so we can add a user id which would be an integer from pg core uh, the name of this would be user id and this references really we do it like this user.id so my understanding is that this is just like in sql is defining a foreign key but in addition to that, it looks like we can define a, and this is something that's newer to uh, Drizzle ORM, uh, which is like, they're trying to be a little bit like Prisma um, because people realize that, yeah, a thing that's close to SQL is really nice, but a, uh, a relations API is also really nice and convenient. So they're trying to play a balance here. All right, so they have this section here for one-to-many, which is 
uh, pretty similar to what we're trying to do. So I think I'll just copy this and so our user, so user relations, our user has a one too many, uh, let's call it tasks, which is a to do. I need to import this from Drizzle ORM. And then I guess you could also do the, the inverse, right? Of a to do has an author, just like in the documentation, but I'll leave that out for now. And also another thing that's good to call out, I think is uh, they had some uh, stuff here in the docs about foreign keys where they're, they're actually calling out how, so if we were to define the inverse relation, it kind of will look like this where uh, we would have an author of a uh, user for the to-dos and notice that it also has references in the key here. But the thing that they're uh, calling out in the documentation here is that the relation doesn't necessarily create a database level foreign key constraint. It's just uh, a virtual uh, relationship, which I think was a, a good decision because there's databases like PlanetScale that apparently doesn't support foreign keys. So everything is sort of just like a uh, virtual relationship. So basically what that means is you can create, you know, your relations between tables without necessarily creating the database constraint, you can just enforce the the relationship via the, the application layer. Let's go ahead and see if we can generate some migrations since we've manipulated the tables, right, and created a new one. So uh, remember in package.json, I did create a, a generate script here in preparation for this. So drizzle kit generate PG and then also point it back to the uh, drizzle config. So let's go ahead and run npm run generate. And this is interesting. It's saying issue table created or renamed for another table. Uh, so I guess it can't sort of determine that itself. Let's say that it is renamed. Is a user table created or renamed for another table? Uh, that one is created. So that one I think is a little odd. It obviously shouldn't have existed before. So, um, but I guess the ability to pick is nice but you'll see that it generated uh, a new SQL file. So if we look at this, we see that it's creating our new user table. It's altering, renaming our to-dos to to-do. It did correctly add our user ID and also created our foreign key constraint. Uh, so that looks pretty good. But anyways, uh, you're probably wondering how do we run this? So I do have this migrate.ts file here which is basically the same as our index.ts, except uh, it pulls in this migrate from the Postgres.js migrator. Uh, so you can see that this is specific to this driver. And similarly, you know, it's creating a client, it's creating a DB. We pass that into uh, this migrate DB and then we tell it where is our uh, folders for migration. So it's gonna look for these files. Um, I haven't actually ran this before, so let's try a, uh, I guess I'll create a new script for that. Migrate. And we'll do TSX. We don't need to watch. We do still need to pull in uh, environment variables. So we'll do migrate.ts. And let me add some logs here because I don't know if it actually logs anything. Right? Uh, let's go to our terminal. Let's do npm run migrate. There you go. Not very much logs here. I wish there was a little bit more logging. Uh, I'm not sure if you can make it verbose. But let's go ahead and look at our database. We now have a new user table and also a to do table, right? So that's pretty much, I think, migrations in a nutshell. By the way, I might have covered this earlier, but notice that you can have your your uh, schema split up between different files. And that's why the, the schema here parameter uh, accepts a glob pattern. And they do have a uh, this push thing, which I, I believe this is something that I've seen in Prisma where it allows you to kind of just sync your schema, your local code base schema to your database schema without actually going through migrations. It'll just like try to synchronize it for you. Um, but it says that it doesn't yet support Postgres SQL. So I guess I wouldn't have been able to use that here anyways. Um, but that sounds like it will be useful for prototyping. Um, but yeah, the lack of support definitely you just got to pay attention there. 
again i think drizzle kit as a whole just feels like it's still too young it needs some time to mature um, but what they have here is is nice the one thing they didn't quite answer is how do they keep track of which migrations have been run and it just says that drizzle kit drizzle will automatically do that so again because i didn't see it in the database i assume it's in the code which i was looking in this meta folder and i think that's what this is supposed to be where uh here we go there's an there's an array of entries of what it ran which is our lethal devos and the nebulous right so those are our two scripts and then there's snapshots here at a glance it seems like it's taking a snapshot of the full database and that's probably how it it creates a uh, a new migration based on those snapshots so so that's a, actually an interesting difference that i've seen where it seems to maintain the source of truth fully on the code and not on the database itself uh, let's go ahead and actually write some queries right so remember we have an index.ts here that is using uh, tsx watch so i think i have that on start so we'll do npm start you can see that it's logging right so maybe let's try to do some inserts so we have data db dot insert values and am i supposed to provide a table here yep so it says table was not provided so we're going to insert users first um user and we've imported user from our schema values i imagine this is prov uh requiring an array we just need to provide name uh which i made a mistake here this should have been name so looking at the docs, it does say you can pass either an object or you can pass like a, what I was trying to do, an array of objects. If you want to insert multiple rows and then there is this thing called returning, which uh, returns back your your result, I guess. All right, so let's do. There we go. And I need to remember that. Uh, every time I made changes, this was probably inserting the same record over and over again. So maybe we can do just to make sure the database is empty. That should empty it out, I think. All right, so I inserted two users here. Database again, we should have two users. All right, so 13 and 14, I'll probably uh, delete this so it doesn't run again. I guess what I would like to see, I didn't see it in the documentation, is a way to seed the database. That's something that Prisma supports. But anyway, so we should have two users. Let's try to actually query those users. Let's do again result await uh, db.select from. So you see from table, right? And the, the objects that we have in our schema effectively is like the, the table. So if we do select from user and let's do some console ninja here. All right, so there's our uh, query for users. Uh, I actually want to insert a couple of those to do's and uh, try to create like the relationship between the to do and the user so that we can try some of the uh, relationship querying. So let's see how we can do that. Um, I'm gonna have to do a couple inserts again and maybe I'll just kill my running application for now so that it doesn't uh, insert a bunch of things again. So let's do await db.insert. So we'll say that uh, title record YouTube video title title and uh, user ID should be 13. Um, let's go another one here. All right, so I got a couple inserted values here. Let me run start again. That should have inserted, hopefully. Let me kill this. And it is in our database. And then let's say that I want to query my tasks. If we were to first query a specific person, user where just pass ID in here, 13. 
Oh, so it's not an object. I think I briefly saw this in a documentation. We have to do like a function thing here. ID equals 13. And this utility is in Drizzle ORM. And I actually got it wrong. You actually have to do it like this where you, you kind of compose the functions together. I guess I have to kind of unlearn the syntax of other ORMs like, like Prismo and type ORM to uh, use this, which is fine. Um, so I think we do equals where user dot ID equals 13. And then we got to do returning. Um, no, that's, we don't need to do a returning because it's a select. So it seems like you only do returning when you're doing like things like insert, delete and update, I guess. Let's run this. Let's log that. And you can see that we are getting our, our user with ID 13, although it's returning in an array, which conceptually makes sense, right? If you write a SQL query with, you know, a where clause, it's technically, it could technically return more than one. So I kind of understand that. Um, so I guess I can do like uh, this structure like this and that will give me my specific object. Anyways, so we've got our user like this. So my understanding is if we were trying to query my tasks, uh, obviously with just straight up SQL, you could always do a, uh, a left join. So let's manipulate this to have a join, left join to do. And I imagine there's an on, like how do I provide left join on? That's not the most intuitive. I guess I provided it in here. Okay, so you provide the on clause inside this. Um, makes sense. So we're gonna do again where, where to do dot user ID equals user dot ID. Once you do know like the general idea of the API kind of does make sense and is seems fairly intuitive. Let's see what we got. So it returns us an object that actually separates the two things together. So we've got our, our user and one to do. I was expecting an array here. Did I make a mistake? because I'm destructuring here, let's do, so if I print out the entire array, I get back something like this, which is an array of objects that has user in it and in to do in each thing, which is fine. Uh, it wasn't super intuitive to me, I guess, again, coming from other ORMs, I would have expected it to uh, return me something that looks like this. Like I'm expecting it to have been like tasks and then your array of tasks, right? Um, but I guess you could always wrap a call like this and you do your own sort of uh, utility function on user land and you know, reduce that to what you expect it to look like, which again, it's not terrible, but I think this is why they have a separate relations query uh, to make this better, which looks like this. Let's try it. Uh, it does say I have to actually feed the schema into our DB thing here because it um, needs to be aware <laughs> needs to be aware of the schema. So we are going to place this as a star and let's do schema that user. Uh, let's get rid of our join here. So hopefully you, you kind of understood how the joins work there. But in here we pass in schema and then let's try to do the same thing of querying our user tasks except through uh, the relations API, which you do via db.query. Let's just call it result await first find me. So it does look like uh, they have that API for like getting the first thing in the many. Let's try find first with uh, tasks true and got an error. There is not enough information to infer relation user that tasks. User relation has many to do's. 
I don't know why it says there's not enough information. I wonder if because I need to define the inverse relationship. Let's try that. So remember, I skipped this earlier. Uh, let me copy this and just manipulate it because I'm lazy. So let's do to do relations to do and a to do has an author of user to do the user ID which references user that ID. Did that fix it? It did remove our bug. Um, so I guess that's a gotcha. I don't know if they call that out that you have to define both sides. Um, in some ORMs, you're allowed to just do it on one side. But uh, I guess I wasn't logging the result. Log the result, and there we go. And this is what I was expecting. This is kind of what I was looking for. Uh, again, I guess the, the relation query here is like your higher abstraction, right? This is kind of what some people want coming from Prisma. So we got the, you know, the user object and then the task sort of uh, nested embedded in there. So that's kind of nice. I like that. So I did do find first, which is convenient because it happened to be the first one that we were looking for. But if we do find many, I expect our two users to show up one with no tasks but how do i add a where clause here can i do now this is where like without looking at the docs i don't know if do i do where id 13 is that valid or do i do the equals thing where equals uh user dot id 13 okay so that looked like the correct result um, I guess I could also do this again, find first, but with the where clause that should return the same result. There you go. Again, this is where maybe it's just a learning curve for me where like at some places it tries to act, it's, it tries to be working at the higher abstraction, sort of like Prisma, but then in, in other places it still, uh, makes you use uh, this utility function, which is fine i think uh the consistency is also good there uh so there you go so th that's pretty much like drizzle at a very quick uh overview right let me walk you through some of the docs as well like if you were trying to do crud right we did like selects they do show there's an api here for doing uh just partial selects of like specific fields and then we didn't try any of these, but notice that they also have utilities for the different operators. So all of the operators that you might use on where it seems like there's a, a utility function for that, like greater than not equals limit and offset uh, order by utilities for ascending, descending a sub query is just like creating a query and then giving it like the alias and passing it in to the from. I like that. That's very nice. And we looked at inserts. I believe updates are very similar, right? You do instead of insert, uh, you do set and then delete is again, pretty similar. So I guess like, you know, the basic CRUD SQL is exactly what you would expect it to be. I didn't cover uh, indices too much. They do have support for that. Uh, that you can add in the schema so but that one is part of the main uh, like table uh, object one thing worth mentioning is that you can get types from inferring from the model like for example here you don't use the table here as your type of like if you wanted to have an, a type for an array of users you have to kind of infer it and then there's some things that i'm not sure if it always returns the inferred model so for example uh, in my current code here, when we select from schema.users, I kind of expect that this is, as expected, an array of name and ID, although it doesn't have that type of users, which makes sense because it's something that we have to kind of infer out of that. But then when we look at the type of the result here for find first, it just has, like, it doesn't know what it is. It has the you can have anything it seems like for the, the user part and then for the tasks it even doesn't know what that is so i think you have to typecast this so i imagine that's because of the relation api that never knows what you're trying to pull in 
um, but the query builder seems to be pretty good about the return type. Again, that's just at quick glance. I don't know if the other uh, APIs are any better. Uh, there is support for views, which you can see the schema here uh, is kind of just like it's similar to defining a table, but you pass in a query. There's also support for transactions, which I haven't tried yet. It looks like you can add logic in there to do rollbacks and such. There's also a section here on performance where it talks about how it's really just a, a light layer above the, the drivers, right? Unlike Prisma where it adds like a, a Rust binary behind the scenes. Um, so it's already pretty performant, but it says that you can also do uh, prepared statements. Um, you can take a look at that. I'm not going to cover it here, but I just wanted to mention it for even better performance. You can try this stuff out. Something that's really nice is that you can also actually use Drizzle, it sounds like, as a standalone query builder, where maybe you just need something that generates like a SQL string and feed that into whatever client you're using. Um, so that's that's pretty nice if you didn't want to use the, the, the ORM features of it and just wanted to have a better uh, TypeScript query builder. Uh, I think that's a pretty good decision. They also have this really nice like SQL template thing where you know from other ORMs where you, when you pass in variables into your word clause, for example, you usually have to like parameterize it. With this little SQL uh, template utility from Drizzle, you can actually just like pass in your variables into your template string and it'll automatically uh, do this parameterization. Uh, again, if you're familiar, this is usually done to, to prevent SQL injection. So it's kind of nice that like it tries to prevent you from making that mistake automatically. So that's really nice. So again, if you were only to use even just this utility to construct your uh, SQL strings, if you needed uh, SQL strings, um, that's very handy. Uh, so I like that. And I think this also alludes to the fact that if the API is not good enough and you had to really go down into the raw SQL land, um, it's really nice to have utilities like this. Anyways, that's a pretty good overview, I think. Uh, at least from my perspective, I got a lot of, out of trying this out. And it's definitely something that uh, I'll probably use in a future project to learn more about it. I'll probably even make uh, more tutorials if, if you want to see tutorials of using Drizzle with, uh, I don't know, perhaps Nest or Next.js or something else. Let me know in the comments. Uh, if that would be helpful and I'll, I'll think about it. Anyways, yeah, closing thoughts. I like where this is heading. I think that, you know, you should know SQL. Engineers that are working with databases should know SQL. And I think that a uh, higher abstraction, although it's convenient, is not always better, especially if those abstractions end up resulting in performance problems because it doesn't generate the SQL that you expect. So if you're working from, I know the SQL that I want to write and I want it to be performant, right? A light layer like this that provides basically everything you need from most ORMs, right? It's like migrations, uh, the ability to query and some relation API. That's pretty much most of what you need. Anyways, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. What did you think of what you saw here? Would you use it? Uh, is it something that would replace Prisma for you or is it not enough? Or if you have any comments or feedback for this video, if you liked it, didn't like it, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear what you think. Anyways, that's it for me. Hopefully you liked the video. I'll catch you on the next one.